everyone to the St. Clair branch of Scenic Regional Library. My name is Steve Campbell. I am the library director. Um, welcome to tonight's candidate form for the St. Clair R13 School Board of Education. Uh, this is the library's first candidate form ever. Uh, we are presenting it in partnership with the Missourian. Uh, we'd like to really thank them for um, working with us on this event to make it happen. Uh, we hope to uh, work with them on future candidate forms next year at all our branches. Uh, the form is being broadcast live on the branches Facebook page. We will also be placing the recording of tonight's form on YouTube and linking that from our website as well as the Missourians website. Those recordings will probably be up sometime next week. Our candidates tonight are Brian Hinson, who is an incumbent. Uh, he's a current member of the Board of Education. Um, Dave Burkle, who's also an incumbent. Uh, we have Heather Ann Van Ness, who's a challenger, and Jason Gazak, who's also a challenger. Our moderators tonight are Megan Maurer, Scenic Regional Library's Assistant Director, <laughs> and also Ethan Colbert, the editor of the Missouri. Our form tonight will last approximately 90 minutes. Uh, each candidate will be uh, given one minute to provide an opening remark, and then at the end, one minute to provide a closing <coughs> remark. Or remarks, I guess. You say. <laughs> the moderators will be asking each, each candidate a series of questions. Um, most of those are taken from the parents and teachers who submitted questions to the form. Uh, each candidate will have three minutes, a maximum of three minutes, to respond to each question. Uh, there will be no opportunity for rebuttals. A candidate uh, can ask to have a question repeated if necessary, but the candidates all have the questions on their podiums as well. Um, our candidates are um, arranged the podium in ballot order, from left to right there. Um, and so the first question the moderators will ask the first candidate on the ballot. The second question will start with the second question, uh, the second candidate on the ballot, and, and so on. Uh, the moderator who is not asking the question will serve as timekeeper. Uh, the uh, timekeeper will show a yellow card when there's 30 seconds left. Yeah, right there. And <coughs> let's see. What is it? Oh, and a red card when time is up. Oh, that. Perfect. Uh, now I ask everybody to silence your cell phones and please no talking during the form. Um, thank you and candidates, good luck. Okay. Um, my introduction, my name is Brian Henson. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the St. Clair. Uh, born and raised here. Uh, my wife and I both graduated from St. Clair School District as well as our children. Um, I joined the school board about, uh, this would be my third term. Um, I still have a passion for our, our community, our school district. Um, the, another reason I'm running again is because I, it's my passion for the school district, but also I want our school district to be the best that it can absolutely be. Uh, and I understand that's a process and we work towards that process because if our school is good, our community is gonna be good. Um, if we have that kind of bright, shiny castle on the hill as our school, we're gonna produce great, great students that come through there and uh, hopefully come back and help build our community bigger and better. And that's all I have. My name is David Burkle and I'm 70 years old. I'm a retired deputy chief uh, assistant fire marshal from the city of Brentwood, Missouri, uh, 30 years of service. I'm a 1970 graduate of St. Clair High School, a 1974 graduate of Southwest Missouri State University, and I had got a bachelor's uh, of science degree in business, and then I graduated from the St. Louis County Fire Academy in 1981. I, I too am a lifelong resident of St. Clair, uh, married to my wife, Bonnie Landing Burkle. She's a 1974 graduate. We have two kids. Our son, uh, Benjamin, graduated in 2000 and is currently serving in the U.S. Coast Guard. Our daughter, Candace, is a 2004 graduate of St. Clair High School and is working as a special education instructor, instructor and currently the all Ed instructor. The St. Clair, I've been on the St. Clair School Board for 30 years and currently serving as the board president. I've been active with the Missouri School Board Association and the Missouri Association of Rural Educators with countless hours of training and seminars to stay up to date with new innovations concerning <coughs> education, safety, and finance. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Vaness. I'm a lifelong resident born and raised in St. Clair, Missouri. I have two daughters. My oldest daughter graduated last year from St. Clair High School. She's currently a freshman at Stevens College in Columbia. My youngest daughter is a sixth grader at the junior high. I'm running for school board because I think our children are struggling 
I think our teachers are needing some assistance and some support, and I'm here to make sure that our school district is the best that it can be. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is uh, Jason Gazak, and uh, I have been married 27 years to my lovely wife, Erin, and we have three beautiful children, Austin, who is uh, 27, Dawson, who is 24, and Zoe, who is 21. We have been in St. Clair for 40 years, although I did leave for a few years to help start a church up in St. Louis, moved back. Um, my wife and I and my two younger children graduated from St. Clair. Um, I am a pastor here in town of Roots Church. I also own my business, have owned my own business for 27 years. Um, I'm very passionate about what I do, and when I do things, I do it 100%. Um, I can, you know, I don't have any problems speaking my mind for the things that I believe that I'm passionate about. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not one to just say no or create controversy just to create controversy. That's not what I do. I'm a team player. I buy in once a decision is made, like it's if it's my own decision. Um, I have no ulter ulterior motives of running. Uh, I saw an opportunity when a good friend of mine, Russ King, stepped down. And um, Jason, I'm sorry, your time. Oh, wow, that was all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. We will begin tonight's forum with our first question, and our first question goes to Brian. Brian, what makes a school board member effective? You have three minutes. Well, I, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's there's several parts of that. I think being a good listener, you're also an ambassador for your community. You know, uh, you. Some of our best stakeholders that we have are our teachers and our, our teachers and our parents. Um, and just being a good listener to them, you know, helping kind of bridge the gap between them and administration sometimes, but also explaining them, explaining to parents, explaining to staff why things are done the way they're done. There's some things that are just out of our control and could be state legislation. Um, but I think it's just, just listen. Let people want to be heard. Just listen, um, you know, address what you can address. And if you can't answer a question for them, be honest and say, hey, I, I don't know the answer to that right now, but I will find out and I'll get back with you. Um, I, I, it's that being honest and just being a good communicator, I think is what an effective school board member um, is. I also think really your education on the school board process of things that are within our scope and things that are outside of our scope and understanding where you're at within that process. Um, you know, there, there's things that people think that we can do, but that's not in our scope of what we do. It's what we have administration and stuff like that for. So um, that's about all I'm gonna add to that. I know it's a short time, but. Thank you, Brian. Next, same question to you, David. You have three minutes. Okay, I believe that uh, uh, what makes a school board member effective is one that gets out in the community, out in the school, and uh, talks to the, the uh, teachers, talks to students, talks to parents, kind of gets a, an idea of how what the feel of the, of the community is. And I think uh, that is probably the, the biggest job that a school board member has, is getting out and uh, meeting with his constituents and, and everybody around. Uh, it's also very important for the school board members to be uh, well versed as far as their training. There's training that you have to keep up with through the, through the years and uh, we always have uh, a couple of different uh, programs that we can go to, one through the MSBA and one through the Missouri uh, Rural uh, Education Association. Both of those are, are really good and, and you get to learn a lot about uh, different things that, that go on with the school. Uh, being in touch with the administration is very important, knowing what's going on as far as uh, how the school is being run. The school board member is, is in the governance part of, of running the school, and it's not really part of the day-to-day -day operation, so it's, it's a little bit different, but uh, it's really good to stay in touch with the administration and have good, good communications back and forth with them. Thank you. Our next uh, candidate is Heather. Heather, same question to you. You have three minutes. I think what makes a good school board member effective is just getting out in the community and talking with everyone, talking to the community, talking to your teachers, talking to parents, talking to students, um, talking with your administration, your building administration, talking to your support staff, your janitors, 
and your bus drivers really kind of dig it in deep to kind of see what is actually going on within the school building and within, within the community and within the district. Also being that mentor in between administration and teachers if there is issues or any of support staff. I do believe that if you do a lot of research and actually do a lot of think processing on your own and having a good conversation with other board members as a team, I think you can do a really good job um, at doing the best for what's good for everyone in the community and the school district. Um, there are a lot of hard decisions that need to be made that you have to make, and I think that with all confidence and all knowledge and speaking with everyone about it, you can make those good educated decisions to make the <coughs> school district a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Jason, same question to you. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, I agree with what all of these guys are saying, and this lady beside me, uh, I do think you have to definitely be a good listener, uh, allow people to speak their mind and validate what they're going through, whether that's a student, teacher, administration, a parent, anybody that's involved in the district itself, I think um, being educated on what is going on around us so that way you can make better decisions, definitely getting out into the community as well, and also even into the school, walking around, talking with students, talking with teachers, um, and just finding out how, how things are going. Being a school board member is not an easy task from what I understand because you have to make decisions that's not gonna make everybody happy. So I think one of the things that would make a successful, an effective school board is not being persuaded by being a people pleaser just to please the crowd, but literally uh, looking at the situation with a 40,000 foot view and making the best decision that you can as a team, what's best for the students and the teachers. There's no way you can please everybody. Uh, the goal though is to at least give everybody a voice and do what you can to make the best decisions that you can. Our second question will begin with you, David. Missouri testing scores show that more than 70% of students are not proficient in basic science knowledge. Even trade jobs that require less higher education are requiring a high degree of technological knowledge to attain high paying jobs after graduation. What is your district-wide plan to improve STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, education, and increase opportunities for students to succeed in the modern economy? David, you have three minutes. Well, right off the bat, we do have a CSIP program that uh, we work on, and uh, that kind of gives us a, uh, a, a place to start on all this. But our school right now is working on a lot of these things. We do have a, a program right now that's uh, being run by an actual rocket scientist, and he uh, is uh, doing great things with uh, a lot of our students, uh, with in getting them inter interested in engineering and uh, robotics and things like that. Uh, we're also working very closely with some of our local industry. Uh, Gary Lamb, he's been very, very kind to let us uh, have some students intern down at his business and it's really been working out well for us, and he's also gaining some uh, helpful employees as well. Uh, I think it's, you know, that's the, the, the way our, our uh, world is going right now. It's very important, and I think that uh, we're, we're trying to be on the cutting edge of that. Uh, I know we're taking small steps, but, uh, you know, we're a small school, and, uh, and we're going to just keep working at it and, and trying to do, it, do everything right. Thank you. I've been attending a lot of the school board meetings the past two years, and yes, there are a lot of good programs in the school district, which is a blessing for a lot of the kids going into engineering programs and such. They have a wonderful engineering program. Um, they do a lot to benefit the kids. I'm not really knowledgeable this, in this area, so the best comment I can say is to keep those programs going, keep them funded, and anything else that we need that can push the kids to excel, we need to make sure that we make an effort to do so. Uh, I'm with Heather on this one uh, because I haven't been super involved in all the details of what's going on within the district. But um, from what I, I have definitely heard about the rocket scientist that's involved, I've also heard about the new program with the trade skills that's happening. Um, there are some th there are some great things that are continuing that are that St. Clair is doing. I think something for me that I'm passionate about when I think about how our kids. Um, being educated and how can they learn these specific things when I'm looking at science, technology, engineering, 
one of the things that I recognize probably the most in schools across the country, maybe not just, uh, not specifically St. Clair, but uh, there are a lot of distractions outside uh, or maybe even inside, not from the administration itself, but just the social things that kids are dealing with right now and even behavioral issues that are very difficult for teachers and the administration to handle when you have a lot of kids that are going through some of the things that, that they have, whether it's ADHD or special needs, whatever it might be. And that can be a challenge when you're trying to do any program in the school. So I don't have a complete knowledge on these specific things, although I, knew, I know that the current board and the administration is working on the future of the technology from what I've heard and when I've talked to them, and I think it's an amazing thing, and my job is just to help that keep, keep going. Brian? Go ahead. Um, I'm gonna to touch on the test scores here real quick, um, and I'm gonna kind of piggyback on what Mr. Mr. Perkle said. Um, on the test scores, you know, it, it's, it's a, COVID has affected a lot of schools, and we were not missed by that at all. Um, our wonderful administration, they have plans in place to start to improve those test scores. Um, and to kind of go into what Mr. Uh, Burkle had talked about, we have a, a, a wonderful program at that school with Mr. Gritzman, the, uh, with what he does teaching those kids. Um, I have been an advocate and we just, we got it going again with building traits uh, in our schools. Because part of being a school is to help prepare our kids for life outside school. And we, we have recognized that Higher education isn't for everybody. We understand that. So we want to bring back building trades to give those kids an opportunity so they can go on and have successful lives as well. Um, once again, to piggyback on what Dave said, we do have several programs that are going on right now. Uh, we, we review those each year with our administration. And I mean, they are constantly, constantly looking at those things and look for ways for us to improve. Thank you. Our third question goes to Heather. Heather, the question is, internet infrastructure to our rural students is a big challenge, and many of our students live in areas with no internet access. Even if the internet is available, most do not have an economical high-speed option. Over time, this can have an impact on the development of adequate tech-related skills, which are now crucial for college admittance and many career paths. How will you work with local, state, and national leaders to advocate for the need for affordable internet accessibility for all of our students. Heather, you have three minutes. This is really a big issue, I do know. I have a lot of friends that live out in the country. They do not have good internet service at all. Their kids get upset when they can't play the video games. Um, besides that, with the education prospect of it, um, I think that working with our state leaders and to see if there's some funding that can be done with the getting funding for any of the companies that come out and put those lines in to get that internet access out there. If there's any other opportunities for that to be done, I'd be willing to talk to them, speak on behalf of the school district and get that process taken care of. There's not much more than trying to lobby and get it all taken care of so we can get our students what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Jason, you have the same question. You have three minutes. I think this is a, a really loaded and difficult question, honestly, because uh, the school board has nothing to do with getting the internet out into the rural areas. Uh, obviously, we will work with state and local people to you know, encourage that to happen. I think the bigger question for me is, when I'm seeing uh, many of our students live in areas with no internet access, I would like to know exactly how many do not have access. Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? What is it? Because that matters to me. Uh, also, again, um, it says they don't have economical high-speed option. Well, again, what speed do they have? What can they get? Um, we live in the 21st century, and I know we have some rural areas, but there's a lot of places that do have that ability. Or I feel like even working with parents and, and students to find a different way. If they can't get the Internet at home, let's find a different avenue. Use this beautiful library up here for students to come and actually have education. The problem is, what I see is everybody wants everything handed to them and not work for it. What are we supposed to do? School board members cannot make students learn, neither can the administration. Parents have to do whatever they have to do to get their children out and get educated. 
They rely too much on the teachers, too much on the, on the school, and really parents need to be held accountable for this particular question, in my opinion. Thank you, Jason. Brian, it's now your question, and you have three minutes. Okay. Um, you know, we, we do have a very vast rural area within our district, and with when we were doing remote learning, that, that was a challenge for us with internet access sometimes. Um, all I can say is, you know, look, to kind of touch on what Jason said a little bit, that's kind of out of our hands. The only thing we can do is we can work with our state, uh, local legislators, county legislators, to see what can be done to maybe one of these days make internet a uh, utility, like electric or whatever, make it a utility versus of how much are you willing to pay to have it at your house. So, I mean, it's, it is kind of a loaded question, but you know, there's, we don't really have a whole lot of bearing on, we can't make AT&T provide internet to Indian Creek Road or whatever, you know, it's just something we can't do. But I feel we can maybe, talk with our legislators of maybe we can see what we could do to one of these days make it a utility versus what it is now, a more of a luxury thing. David, the question is now you. You have three minutes. All right, well, uh, during the pandemic, the St. Clair School District did have some uh, options for the kids to be able to uh, hook up to the internet. Uh, it was not the best in the world, but it was better than nothing at all. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that uh, a school board member uh, as a whole, we all need to work with our state and uh, local uh, government leaders like our representatives. Be sure you get out and communicate with them. Write letters. Call them. If you see them on the street, talk to them and, and tell them the importance of this. And, and I'm sure that most of them know that it's very important and uh, it's getting more important as we, we go along. Of course, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more options for internet. You can get the internet uh, off of uh, phone systems. You can get it, uh, you know, like cable TV. You can get, you know, there's several different options out there. There's satellites, but a lot of those aren't, uh, financial. a lot of people aren't financially able to pay for a lot of those. But uh, it is very important, and it's important to our school district and our, and our students. Thank you. All right, Jason, our fourth question will go to you. Jason, how will you ensure that the decisions you're making are supported by the stakeholders, the teachers, parents, students within the district? You have three minutes. This kind of goes along with question number one. I mean, it's again, it's, it's getting out involved in the community. It's getting out uh, into the schools, speaking with the administration um, and, uh, and the teachers and anyone on staff um, you know, to find out what they, the thing of it is, I think the biggest challenge is the school board isn't on the front lines. And uh, so we have to listen to the people that are actually on the front lines to find out what is going on in the schools. And so you do that by talking to the students, you do that by talking to the teachers, and of course the administration is necessary. And you know, you're working with them to do the best you can. I'm gonna say it again. There's no way to make everybody happy. There's no way to solve all the problems in the school district. We do not have a, a magic wand that we're gonna take into the school board and just go bling and then all the problems are fixed. We have to work together as a team. And when I say team, that's students, parents, faculty, administration, and the school board has to work together to try to make the best that we can for the students with everything that goes on. Back in my day, and. A couple of the ones standing up here, we didn't have the internet on our phones like we do today. That is a huge challenge. There's things that, you know, that can be done. Um, there's things that have been done and, and people didn't like that. Again, you're gonna make decisions and here's, I will say this, you know, I believe that none of us are up here to be on the scoreboard to be popular. This is not to be popular, this is to actually lead. And when you lead, you have to make tough decisions that people don't like but you have to do what's best for the students and the teachers. And that's what I feel like that I will do to, to make decisions, to, to make St. Clair school, school District continuing to be better just like it is now. Thank you, Jason. Brian, your response, you have three minutes. Sure, um, a, a big thing is communication. Uh, to kind of, you know, to piggyback on what Jason said, you know, it's, it's communication, it's talking to people. And a lot of times by the time they come talk to us, 
they already know what's going on. So my follow-up question to them is, okay, what would you do? So it's having that, that dialogue <coughs> with the parents, the teachers, all those involved. It's having that dialogue. But you know, when it comes down to it, we as school board members, our decisions are based on what's best for the school district, not just a certain niche or this or that. So, and it's what's best for our kids. Um, but once again, it, it all comes down to communication. I mean, that's, that's what it boils down to. Thank you, Brian. David, you have three minutes. All right, I think the, uh, it's, it, it goes without saying, everybody's probably going to say the same thing, but it's, it's about communications. It's, it's about being out in the, in the community, about being out in the school district, going to games or going to uh, the uh, different meetings at school. It's getting out there and talking to the people in the, in the district to find out what's, what's on their mind. What would they like to see done or is, is this something that's really important? Uh, it kind of goes back to the whenever we were, had the thing on the cell phones. What a what a big deal that was, and uh, you know there was a lot of people on both sides of that. But uh, when it when it all came down to it, it was all about going around and visiting and people telling you exactly what they thought needed to be done with that. And, and again, you're going to be making decisions that are sometimes good, and sometimes it's going to not make somebody happy. And and uh, that is that just goes with it. Uh, I think the bottom line to making any decision for the school is uh, you should always ask yourself if it's something that's going to be best for kids and I think if you can go go with that you'll be fine thank you thank you David and Heather the question is yours you have three minutes I think when you make decisions as long as you educate yourself as long as you hear the people that you're making the decision for or in regard to as long as you like they said communicate with everyone have an open mind be honest I've always told my kids if you're going in with honest intentions, with a good heart, you never really can do anything wrong. And if people know that you have the best intention for them and for their kids, for the teachers, for the faculty, for the district in a whole, for the community, and you're out there talking to them and getting their feedback and knowing what's important to them and you're actually pursuing that, sometimes you can't do exactly what you want to do because it's a team effort, but I think that sometimes even good intentions can't be, can't be done but in that case I would at least like to explain to them that I tried and it just didn't happen but I think that just talking to people is really really the best way to do it our fifth question tonight goes to Brian uh, Brian the question is per a report from the National Educational Association Missouri teachers are among the lowest paid teachers in the nation ranking 47th out of 50 states for average pay and 50th for new teacher pay. What ideas do you have to help attract and retain high quality teachers to the St. Clair District? And what do you propose to do to help bring salaries in line with neighboring districts so that the students here have a chance to receive a good quality education from teachers? That is a very good question. Um, yeah, it's sad for 47 out of 50. Um, to kind of touch on, I'm going to kind of jump ahead here to what do I propose to help bring salaries in line to make our neighboring districts. A lot of that really, when it comes down to it, especially for our community, because I'm born and raised here. So unless we have some sort of economic boom in this community, or we significantly raise taxes, which nobody wants, I'm open to suggestions. And I'm sure everybody up here would be as well. Um, as far as we have some amazing, amazing staff that are just dedicated beyond dedication to our to our community and our kids. Um, and we are all aware that we cannot afford to pay them what they deserve. We just, I mean, if it was there, we'd do it tomorrow. But I feel what we can do for our staff is we can give them the best work environment that we can give them. Um, we try to Anytime we get uh, uh, any type of uh, windfall or something, we always try to pass it on to our staff so that it's not um, So there's always things we love to do for our staff to let them know they are appreciated. Could we do more? Sure. I mean, I think of things all the time. We could do, you know, uh, take them coffee each day, those, those things like that. But I, 
So that it comes back to what we can afford to do and what we can't afford to do. Um, but, but what we can't afford to do is try to give, promote the best work environment we can for them. Thank you, Brian. David, the question is to you, you got three minutes. I think Brian pretty well hit it on the head there as far as uh, how to uh, retain our teachers. At this point, uh, all we can offer them is have given them the best place to work that they can, can and uh, have an administration that supports them completely and uh, keeps them going. Uh, until the tax base in the St. Clair School District, St. Clair Community, until it increases, we're pretty well uh, stuck with the uh, amount of tax money that we're getting right now and we're not able to uh, increase much of anything. Uh, whenever you go into finance, we have a certain uh, certain fund that uh, is made just for salaries, and uh, you know we can we go over that, and and we can run in the red, but you don't want to do that too often. But uh, there's there's times whenever you have to. But uh, right now, the way that the economy is, I just don't see any way that uh, our tax base is going to increase enough that we're going to be able to catch up with some of the schools around us. We might get close but I don't think we can, we can get up to exactly where they are. And we are filling a lot of, we're, a lot of our teachers are leaving and that was, that's the main reason that they're leaving is, is that they can get a pretty good uh, pay increase just by going six miles away one way or the other and, and, uh, and still do the exact same job. And, and that's the bad part of, of our district at this point is that we're losing our really good teachers to that. Uh, as far as, uh, uh, the purpose, you know, we want to bring those salaries up, but uh, again, it, it all goes back to your tax base, and, and uh, we just seem to be like we're, we're stuck right where we are, and, and uh, you know, it'd be nice if we get something going like out at the airport, if we get some big industry come in there, some big box stores, you know, anything to generate some uh, tax dollars. But other than that, I think we're, we're deemed to just plug along where we're at. Thank you. Thank you, David. The question now goes to Heather. Heather, you have three minutes. I know that a lot of the money that comes into the school district does come from tax dollars. Uh, we don't have a real industrial boost going on right now. Um, but I would like to honestly get in the board, take a look at the finances, see if there's anything that we can do with what we have um, to kind of improve that, maybe do some incentives, some retirement incentives for the teachers to actually stay and retire here in our district. Um, our teachers are very important. Um, the main thing is to give them a good work environment, a good work environment, a happy work environment where there's no tension between the teachers and the administration, building administration, central office administration. I think that we need to work really hard at gapping any lacking in that department. Um, I think that we can probably, I, I'm excited. I, I honestly want to get in there, just take a look and see if there's anything that I can do to benefit the teachers to, to help. And if there's not, that's, then I find out that there's not. But I really would like the opportunity to kind of see what's going on and uh, maybe we can figure a way out to keep our teachers here. Thank you, Heather. The question is now to you, Jason. You have three minutes. Well, again, this is one of those things that um, people would like to see ma major change. It's sad that we are 47 out of 50, but we have to look at the reality of where we are. You want teachers or you want tax dollars to increase. We need, new, we need more rooftops. Uh, we need more businesses in this town. I've been here 40 years and it just hasn't happened. So we have to look at the reality of where we are. Um, I will say this, I have talked to several of the people currently on the board and some of the administration, and I know for a fact they are doing something. They're doing what they can, and I think that needs to be told to people, and there needs to stop being a misunderstanding that the school board is just sitting on their hands with a pile of cash when that's not the reality. The reality is they are doing something for the teachers with what they can in the realms of the guidelines of the finances that they absolutely do have. I agree with Dave and Brian. We need to create an environment where teachers are safe and, and love working. <laughs> Listen, all four of us are St. Clair uh, residents forever. The teachers that are in our school district, a lot of them are from St. Clair. Those are the type of people we need to be in the education, doing it for the good of this community. I know we all would like to see the town grow, 
Um, but at the same time, listen, St. Clair is a great place to live, regardless if there's growth. There's a lot of good people in this town. And um, it, it's just not something we can physically do to raise tax dollars, number one, to bring more income in. And let's not forget that uh, teachers will never be paid enough to do what they do. Trust me, they won't. But at the same time, I also know teachers have a very good retirement package. Uh, they have better retirement package than a lot of people from what I've researched. And so we have to look at that side of it as well. There's a, you know, there's a balance in everything we do. We cannot lean so far one way and not pay teachers, but we also can't lean so far the other way and pay them way more than what we physically can and uh, more than you know what you know a lot of people would like. So I think again, it's just working with the teachers. I think again, the administration and the current board is doing what they can. I sat at the last meeting, there was conversation that happened, it was going in a great direction, and there's a lot of people willing and open to give raises and, and work on uh, where we are, but we also have to look at reality. There's only so much to give. So let's not pretend like we can do a lot when it's not there. We're going to do what we can. At least if I'm there, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to work with the other board members and um, Dr. Cruz at this current state, and uh, we're going to do what we can for the teachers. Okay, question number six. We'll start out with you, David. House Bill 253, also known as the Open Enrollment Bill, recently passed the Missouri House with a vote of 85 to 69 and now goes to the Senate. The current St. Clair School Board voted to join 177 other school districts opposing the bill. What are your thoughts on the impact of open enrollment as it is currently written on the St. Clair School District? You have three minutes. Well, on the way it's written, I, uh, for one, have been against the uh, open enrollment. I've talked to my representatives, uh, <coughs> sent uh, emails to them, I've talked to them in person, and trying to get it out there what, uh, that that could really hurt our district. With our district in, uh, in the state that we're at right now, as far as being locked in on our funding, uh, something like the open enrollment, if we had several, uh, you know, a large group of, of students that moved and, and wanted to go to one of the other schools around us for whatever reason, whether it be ath athletics or, or uh, the educational value of it, we could stand to lose upwards of around $400,000 a year, and that would be a lot of money to, uh, to send out to uh, other districts. That's the, that's the, the reality of it, and, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, like a lot of students, they're thinking more about the athletics, and I know the athletics, if you move to another district, you're going to have to sit out a year. But look at the programs that some of the schools around us have that uh, we aren't able to afford to do, uh, weight rooms and whatnot for football, <clears throat> and different different programs, and uh, it just seems like uh, that's just opening the door for us to lose a lot of students and, and a lot of funding. And uh, I'm going to be against it all the way to the end, unless they change it somehow to where it won't affect us uh, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, David. Heather, the question is yours. You have three minutes. I agree that open enrollment is not good for our district. Like Dave said, it would take money out of the district as it is written now. If they change it, obviously it might be something, but I do think it's bad. We will lose funding and, and students, um, especially if we can't compete with the neighboring districts. So I, I think it would damage us. Thank you, Heather. Jason, the question is yours. You have three minutes. Well, again, this is one of those questions where really we have no say in what happens with open enrollment other than if you want to voice your opinion to our representatives. Um, you know, when I first thought about this and, and spoken with several on the board and some of the administration, you know, my first initial thought is to be completely against it. So. I'm researching it, I'm looking, and I'm not saying I'm for it or against it at this point. I see um, things on both sides. So I might disagree a little bit with some that are standing up here, but it's because I feel like there is more conversation that has to happen with what exactly these things entail. I know we say we'll lose $400,000, but we also would lose teachers as well, which would offset some of that cost from what I understand and from what my knowledge is. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to lose students. Nobody wants to lose teachers. But it's one of these questions where we really don't have any say in it. And I think people 
want to hear us on one side or the other, but when it doesn't affect us, when we can't make a decision, I'm not real sure what the answer would be for people. Um, because again, it's just to me, it could stir up too much controversy on whether you're for it or against it. Again, if it creates competition, which is the other side of you know, open enrollment, I actually think that can be a good thing. I mean, if St. Clair has a great school with great teachers and great education and it's safe and it's fun, then why wouldn't other kids want to come to that if there was open enrollment? Um, I don't know. I just, uh, sometimes we can overthink things and sometimes we can look at numbers and they can also lie. So at the end of the day, uh, what I do in situations like this is I just pray for wisdom when things are like this because sometimes we don't have all the answers and with open enrollment, it's a tough decision. Again, I'm, I'm split right now with the information that I have. I've heard arguments on both sides. Dr. Cruz puts out a very good statement that he sent me that, I mean, it makes a very, very valid point, right? And then I've heard arguments on the other side that brings questions to me as well. I would like to uh, personally do a deeper dive into that. Will it matter? Probably not, because it's not up to me to vote. It's going to the Senate right now. And so, to me, the question's kind of a moot point. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Brian? This is a really hot button issue right now. Um, me, personally, being from this small little town, I, I think this could be a community killer. Um, you take other small school districts like Bourbon, Cuba, other places like that to where the school is not only the school, but it's the community center, it's many other things in that community. And you start having all these kids leaving this school because they want to go play basketball or whatever at whatever school, and now you don't have a school there anymore. So it, it, it could really damage communities. Um, I also look at it from the financial aspect of us, we can lose the kids. Um, and with those kids goes a lot of that state funding, goes to another district. So when that money starts to disappear, and our staff is some of the greatest staff in the world, but we're not gonna be able to retain all of them if we're losing students. And so I, uh, I was one of the ones that voted against it. Uh, I reached out to some of my uh, local reps as well to you know, voice my opinion. And, uh, but it's going to the Senate. We just, we gotta see what happens with it. Thank you, Brian. Our next question tonight goes to Heather first. Heather, your question is this. Because of the high poverty rate in the St. Clair School District, the district qualifies as a Title I district. This provides extra funding to support low-income and at-risk students. According to the district's Title I school-wide program plan, the district directs nearly all of its funding toward the K-2 building. This is potentially cutting off many students from receiving needed intervention, just as it is becoming clear that they are struggling. How do you feel about this practice, and what will you do to improve support for struggling students after the second grade? Heather, you have three minutes. I'm aware of the Title I district fund, school-wide program plan. Um, I've spoken to a lot of teachers in the district, and I do believe that once our kids pass through K through two, once they get to the three through five grade level, they are still struggling. Um, they also, the teachers in that area don't have a lot of the support that they need to continue that education and that help to their students, and they are struggling. Um, to me, if it's not working the way it is, I would like to have ideas on how maybe to split some of that funding to go to the Edgar Murray building, grades three through five, to kind of help support those kids along the way because once they get out of the K through two building and go to Edgar Murray, like I said, they are still struggling and the teachers don't have the resources that they need in that area. And so my thought process is if one thing is not working, maybe try something different to see how that works. You can always change it back. But I don't see an issue into moving any funds from one building to another to help as long as it doesn't take too much away from what's currently, but what's currently there. Thank you, Heather. Jason, the question is to you. You have three minutes. Uh, I, I don't know if the district is really putting all the money to just K through two. That's not information that I have. Um, that's something that I would like to know. 
Um, it's, it's an unfortunate situation that we do live in a very high poverty area. That's a whole nother issue for a whole different group of people. But again, when you hear that, it's like, what's the school board gonna do to, pick, to fix the poverty issue to get more money to these other grades? And you know, honestly, this is why you have a school board and an administration that are, again, those teachers are on the front line. They know what building needs what at what time. One year it might be for one building, the next year it might be for another building. And so that's why you have the school board is to be able to make decisions based off the needs of the students. Truthfully speaking, all of them need help uh, in every area. The kids that are struggling are the ones that are, are being distracted at home. You know, maybe the father's not in the home or maybe there's dis dysfunctional family life and, and that affects children's learning. We can't take and say, oh, well, the district's putting all the money in K2 so all the other kids are struggling and that's the reason. There's way more to it than that. So for me, it's just about, hey, let's find out exactly where those funds are going and talk to the teachers again, communicating with the teachers that are on the front line, the administration in the building, principal, assistant principal, and then also the superintendents and assistant superintendents and say, hey, what can we do? What, how can we allocate or reallocate the funds if need be to get more education into that, into that building? Um, I, I don't know, it's just one of those things where it's just a tough decision. Again, we, there's only so much money in the district to do what people are wanting to do. And every time I turn around and I'm talking to parents or I'm talking to teachers, all they want is more money, more money. We need more money to do more things. And the reality is it's not there. So we have to figure out a different way to do this. Um, and one of those ways, again, is to create good environments in the, in the classrooms, um, it, which I think is going to help with better education and better test scores. I do not believe money is the answer. I believe it's literally relationships, teacher-student relationships, uh, administration-teacher-student relationships. That's what it's going to take to get students to have better education, not more money. Thank you. Brian, the question is to you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I don't honestly know for sure without talking with our uh, administration if all the Title I is funneled to K-2. I don't know. But I do know that we have we have uh, recently hired other reading coaches for uh, the uh, Edgar Murray School, which is their uh, kind of the middle school area. And we're constantly looking at and taking advice from our admin of saying, hey, we need help here, we need help there, we need help there. At any time, and I speak for Dave and I, or any of these, anybody up here, if they come to us and say, hey, we need more help here, we're like, hey, if we can afford to do it, let's do it. Because we want to give our kids every opportunity we can. Uh, but to, to honestly answer your question, I I don't think or I don't know if we put all of our Title I funds in the K-2 through building stuff. So. You know, I, but what I can say is anytime they come to us with needs, we always try to find a way to fill those needs as well as the administration does. Thank you, Brian. David, the question is to you. You have three minutes. Okay, uh, I think uh, through a lot of uh, research and everything that they found that uh, you really need to catch these kids at the K-2 level and uh, for the reading. If you don't get them right off the bat, if you don't get them going right at the very start, they're gonna just get farther and farther behind as they go. So that's why I'm sure that uh, uh, the majority of the money is put into the K-2 building because that is definitely the place that you have to start. Uh, as Brian mentioned there, we, we are looking at uh, reading coaches and reading intervention at the Murray School level, trying to help out with that. And uh, you know we're, we're just always looking at different ways. Reading has always been an issue uh, throughout all the time. I, I you know, Anytime you talk to anybody that, that's had kids, they're gonna say their kids may have had reading problems. My daughter had reading problems. She was good at memorizing, but she really wasn't good at reading. But we finally got her on track, but uh, she's gonna be mad at me over that. Yeah. But uh, no, uh, the, I think our school district is very willing to, to uh, put up the, the money into the reading coaches, reading intervention to try to, to move the kids along, but again, 
whenever you get that Title I grant, you have to have a plan out, and I think the K-2 is the place that they really felt like we needed to do that to get the kids a good start. Thank you. All right, our final question this evening before we go to closing remarks, we'll go to Jason. And that question is, what ideas do you have for helping to meet the needs of the advanced learners in the St. Clair School District? Jason, you have three minutes. Uh, this is a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming when you say the needs of advanced learners, are we, can you clarify? Do you know exactly what they mean by that? I didn't write this question. This was a question that was submitted, but I'm going to say that uh, the needs of advanced learners, I would say, were the opposite of the students we were just talking about, who the, were the students that were struggling. Okay. Uh, so I guess, I mean, initially, you know, we're getting all these questions just here, and I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it's pretty stressful whenever you're trying to answer <laughs> questions like this. I mean, if they're advanced learners, what more do we need to do to meet those needs? I don't know. That's why I'm not understanding the question that well. Um, you know, what ideas do I have for helping meet the needs of advanced learners? I think the school's already doing that. If I understand the question correctly, again, that they already have advanced programs for students. You know, so if they are an advanced learner, they have programs specifically for them. So that way they're not maybe uh, in the same classroom of those that are that might be struggling a little bit or less advanced uh, So they're already doing that. I don't know what more that the school could do necessarily I'm not again in that realm yet once I get there and I hear things I'd be more than happy to discuss it, but it's uh, again one of those things is having um, I mean if you already have programs for advanced classes, I don't really know what more you could do other than making sure you have those classes for them and uh, continue to support, continue to uh, communicate with those that are, are asking for more programs, whatever that may be. So that's really all I have for that question because I'm not quite sure and maybe you guys can help me out there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jason. Brian, the question is yours and you have three minutes. Well, um, to kind of help answer Jason's question, we do offer many advanced courses. Yeah. Uh, we have we offer dual credit courses through East Central College. Correct, mm -hmm. okay, we do offer uh, dual credit courses, so they're available. It's just if they want to take them or not. But uh, we do offer all the advanced courses, uh, like I said, you know, with the, the dual credit. You know, they can get college credits while they're attending the high school. So uh, we do offer those things. Thank you very much. David, the question is yours, and you have three minutes. All right. Well, we even offer some classes, uh, a class called Challenge at the junior high for kids that are uh, learning a little ahead of everybody else. Jennifer Hawkins does a fabulous job with that program and takes her kids to uh, different uh, contests every year, and they do so well, and we're very proud of them for that. But uh, that starts out like in the, at the junior high level, and then they just continue to improve. Uh, as far as the dual credit classes, we do offer a lot of dual credit classes through uh, with East Central. We also, uh, the uh, program that I spoke of earlier that about engineering, that uh, really opens the door for a lot of students that, and, that are advanced and gets them thinking about engineering and where they wanna go with their life and if they wanna go to college and or if they wanna go into the, the private sector, those internships with Gary Land's program down there, that's, uh, that's really been a, a great one for us too. But uh, the, uh, as far as the advanced learners, I think we're, we're doing about as much as we can do unless uh, like East Central or, or another college would step up and kind of give us a little bit uh, uh, more as far as uh, the advanced classes. Thank you. Thank you, David. And Heather, this question goes to you. You have three minutes. I have two of those challenge kits. Mrs. Hawkins is a blessing to this district. She's an amazing person. That's an amazing program. It starts kindergarten through eighth grade is the final grade for that. And there are a lot. The engineering program is amazing. The dual credit programming is amazing. Um, the school district does do a lot for advanced learners. The only thing I think I could possibly think of to add as a comment on this is having a daughter going through high school after that challenge is, is done 
Um, she tends to get bored, bored a lot, she told me, um, in a lot of her classes, and she is in advanced classes. So to me, that would be just conversations with counselors at the school, with teachers at the school, with students at the school to kind of see if there's anything different possibly that we could do, even though we are doing amazing at it, just if there's something different that we can add to that so that they don't come home and everything's easy and they go off to college and they're like, I gotta relearn how to study. <laughs> so um, I think something in that area maybe would be the only thing I could think to add to, add to it. And that's just because that's what my child Okay, we will now move to your closing remarks and um, going in the order we've been going in this evening, we are back to you, Brian. Um, so you have one minute for your closing remarks. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this beautiful <coughs> evening that we've had to uh, mm -hmm. just answer all these questions the best we can. Um, you know, there, we've, we've asked these questions and there was one question in here that I wish would have been addressed, uh, but it's something that we take very seriously here at, at our, our school district is the safety of our staff and our students. Uh, we are, uh, we've taken many measures to ensure that um, with building enhancements, other programs that we've done. But uh, once again, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight uh, and encourage you all to, uh, to go vote April the 4th. There's many good choices. So, uh, but once again, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for being here tonight. David, thanks to you, you have one minute. First, I'd like to thank the Scenic Regional Library of Missouri for hosting this forum. It's really, really been nice and uh, some really good questions came up. Uh, I just want to say that my platform is pretty simple. Try and do the best we can for students and staff of our district with the money that we get from local, state, and federal funding. And I've always been a watchdog over our money and my record shows that as I was involved in the investigation and uncovered the uh, embezzled funds from another taxing entity while serving on their board. As your school board representative, I will be available, transparent, and accountable to those that elect me to do the very best for our children. And if on every decision, whenever you make that decision, you should always ask yourself if that's what's best for kids. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you for participating this evening. Heather, you have one minute for your closing remarks. I want to also thank everyone for coming. Thank you to the Library of Missouri and for also putting this on. This is not my strong suit. I'm very nervous. Um, I just wanted to say that I love the kids. I love the teachers. I love the community. Anything that I can do to better all of it, I'm in. Um, I just want to do what's best for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for participating this evening. And Jason, for your closing remarks, you have one minute. Well, I'd like to thank everybody as well for coming out in the library for holding this forum uh, with questions. Some of these questions were very difficult for myself to answer since I'm not, uh, have all privy to the uh, information. But my goal um, and my platform for me to be on the school board is to continue uh, to make St. Clair District a great school. Um, we do that by making sure the budget is balanced. We make sure that the funds are being appropriately dispersed into the right areas. That's best for the students to be educated. We do that by creating a safe environment for the kids and the teachers. We do that by de uh, dealing with some of the disciplinary, disciplinary actions that need to take place in a way that restores kids back into the school and into the community and not just booting them out and saying good luck. Um, we, we do that by uh, banding together as teachers and parents and students, and that my time's up. Hey, that's okay. So that's my goal, and I uh, appreciate you guys for uh, being here tonight. Thank you, Jason, and thank you again for participating, and I'll pass it over to Steve uh, to end the evening. I just want to thank all the candidates for being here tonight. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Megan again and Ethan for being our moderators. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Just a reminder, all these questions were submitted from teachers and parents. These are the questions when Ethan and Megan went through them, sorted through them, that were being asked the most uh, by the parents and teachers. So um, we didn't write the questions, <laughs> but they were tough questions. And I think everyone did a great job. Um, everybody give our candidates a round of applause. And we hope we can offer these forums again in the future. Thank you very much.